The Boy Who Cried Wolf. Aesop's Fables. What is a fable? A fable is a short story or tale that is intended to teach a lesson. All of the fables in this library were told long ago by a man named Aesop. The Boy Who Cried Wolf. Once there was a shepherd boy who tended a flock of sheep not far from his village. As a shepherd, his job was to make sure that the villagers' sheep were safe and didn't wander away. One day, when the shepherd boy was feeling bored, he decided to play a trick on the villagers to amuse himself. The boy started yelling, "Wolf! Wolf!" as loud as he could. Because he knew the villagers would come running to protect him and the sheep. Well, there was no wolf. The shepherd boy was lying. When the villagers arrived, the boy laughed at them. The villagers realized that they had been tricked, and they became angry at the boy. The shepherd boy, however, thought it was funny to make the villagers stop what they were doing and come running. He played the same trick on the villagers the next day, then again the day after. Both times the villagers were very upset. A few days later, as the boy was tending the sheep, a real wolf approached the flock. When he saw the wolf, the boy immediately yelled, "Wolf! Wolf!" But this time, no one came to help the shepherd boy. The villagers thought the boy was up to his old tricks again. They didn't want to be laughed at, so they simply ignored his cries. Sadly, this time it wasn't a trick. The boy was no match for the wolf, and it easily stole the sheep. From this, the shepherd boy learned two important lessons. First, you should never yell for help if you don't really need it. Second, if you tell lies. People won't believe you, even when you're telling the truth. The boy went to the villagers and apologized for how he had been acting, and asked for another chance. He promised he would never fail them again. It took many months for everyone to trust him, but the shepherd boy had learned his lesson. Because of the shepherd boy's hard work, the wolf never stole another one of the villagers' sheep. The end. Little Red Riding Hood. Once upon a time, there was a kind little girl who lived in a cottage near the edge of the woods. She especially loved her grandmother, who had once made her a red wool cape. The little girl loved the cape, and as she wore it so often, she soon became known as Little Red Riding Hood. One day. Her mother asked her to take some cookies to her grandmother, who lived across the woods and was feeling ill. As Little Red Riding Hood quickly packed the cookies into her basket, her mother reminded her to stay on the main path and not to talk to any strangers. It was a lovely spring day, and Little Red Riding Hood was soon on her way. As she walked along the main path through the woods, she soon came across a wolf. Good afternoon," he said with a smile. "Where are you going on this fine day? Are those cookies I smell?" "Yes, they're for my grandmother who lives across the woods. She's ill," the little girl replied. "But my mother told me I'm not supposed to talk to strangers," she added with a frown. "Why, I'm not really a stranger. I believe I met your grandmother once," the wolf lied. "But your mother is right." You should be careful in the woods. Well, have a nice day," he said as he turned to go on his way. Although the wolf seemed very nice, deep down he was sneaky and mean, since all he really wanted was to eat Little Red Riding Hood. But because men were chopping wood nearby, the wolf didn't dare try. Instead, he came up with an evil plan to trap her. Hoping to get her alone, the wolf said, "Oh, Little Red Riding Hood, since your dear grandmother is sick, you might be interested in taking this shortcut through the woods." He pointed to a small path 
that led into the dark trees. Thank you, Little Red Riding Hood answered. But my mother also said to stay on the main path. The wolf told her that she was a very smart little girl and walked away, thinking his plan had failed. But a few minutes later, he came up with another plan. As soon as Little Red Riding Hood was on her way, the wolf snuck back and took the shortcut himself through the woods, running all the way to Grandmother's house. As soon as the wolf arrived, he knocked on the door. Who's there? Is that you, Little Red Riding Hood? Grandmother called out. Why, yes! The wolf lied, doing his best to imitate Little Red Riding Hood's sweet voice. I've brought you some cookies to make you feel better. Because she was sick in bed, Grandmother didn't get up to see who was at the door, but instead invited him to come in. Of course, before she could even let out a yell, the wolf swallowed Grandmother in a single gulp. The wolf then quickly put on Grandmother's nightgown and hopped into her bed to wait for Little Red Riding Hood, who knocked on the door. Who's there? called out the wolf, trying now to imitate Grandmother's voice. Hearing the low, scratchy voice, however, Little Red Riding Hood was alarmed. Grandmother, it's me, Little Red Riding Hood. Are you all right? she asked. My voices are low and scratchy from my cold, and I'm sick in bed, the wolf called. Please just let yourself in, my dear, and come into my room, he added. And so she did. As she entered the bedroom, Little Red Riding Hood was shocked to see what she thought were her grandmother's eyes bulging from just above the edge of the covers. Why, Grandmother, what big red eyes you have, she exclaimed. The better to see you with, dearie, replied the wolf as sweetly as he could. Please, come a bit closer so that I can get a better look at you. As Little Red Riding Hood took a step closer to the bed, she noticed how very large her grandmother's nose suddenly appeared to be. Why, Grandmother, she said with concern, what a very large nose you have. The better to smell your wonderful cookies with, sweet girl. Please come a bit closer so that I may have one, the sneaky wolf said smoothly. Little Red Riding Hood stepped a little closer, then stopped when she noticed how very long her grandmother's ears suddenly appeared to be. Why, Grandmother, she said nervously, what long ears you have. Nothing to worry about. All the better to hear you with. Please step even closer so that I can listen to your lovely voice, my child, the evil wolf replied getting ready to pounce on Little Red Riding Hood. As Little Red Riding Hood stepped even closer, she became very alarmed at how very sharp her grandmother's teeth now appeared to be. Why, Grandmother, what big sharp teeth you have! she exclaimed. Yes, my dear, and the better to eat you with! shouted the wolf as he quickly leapt out of bed, pouncing on Little Red Riding Hood. She barely had time to let out a loud scream before the wicked wolf swallowed her too in a single gulp. Luckily, the woodcutters were now chopping wood near Grandmother's house. They heard Little Red Riding Hood scream and through a window saw the wolf with a now very big belly sitting in Grandmother's favourite chair. They immediately broke down the front door, grabbed the wolf, turned him upside down, and out fell Little Red Riding Hood and her grandmother. Although they were both shaken up, they were otherwise just fine. The wolf quickly jumped out the window, never to be seen again. From this, Little Red Riding Hood definitely learned a lesson about never talking to strangers. The End The Emperor's New Clothes Once upon a time, in a far-off land, 
there was a lovely little village with green fields and rolling hills. At the top of the tallest hill lived the emperor. The emperor was famous far and wide for his love of fine clothes. He spent hours in front of the mirror admiring himself in his many fancy outfits. One day, two robbers came to the village with a plan to cheat the emperor out of his money. They claimed to be tailors who would make a beautiful new suit for the emperor. We have a special cloth to show the emperor, they announced. It is by far the finest in the land. Surely he will want a suit made from it. Hearing of this, the emperor agreed to meet them. What's so special about your cloth? He asked them. Is it finer cloth than this? He stood up and turned in a circle so that the men could admire his suit. Your majesty, said one of the robbers, this is magic cloth. It is so special that foolish people cannot see it, but clever people can. For three bags of gold, a suit made from this cloth can be yours. Immediately the emperor agreed. Not only would he have the finest suit in all the land, but he would also find out who in his village was clever and who was foolish. The emperor took the men to a room in the castle where they could work. In the room was a large wooden loom for weaving threads into cloth. Thank you, your majesty, one of the robbers said. We shall weave more magic cloth right away. What a suit this will be! A few days later, the emperor sent two messengers to find out when his suit would be ready. When they entered the room, the pair was surprised. There was no cloth on the loom. But then they both remembered that foolish people could not see the cloth. They did not want to be thought foolish themselves, and so they pretended to see it. What beautiful cloth, one of the messengers exclaimed. It will be the emperor's best suit yet. When will it be ready? Tell the emperor that he will have his suit in time for the grand parade on Saturday, promised one of the robbers. The messengers went back to the emperor and told him how splendid his suit was going to be. Everyone in the castle began to talk about it. Soon, news of the suit made from magic cloth spread throughout the entire land. The emperor's subjects couldn't wait to see the emperor in his finery. They were also curious to know which of their neighbors would prove themselves to be foolish by not being able to see the emperor's new clothes. Saturday soon came. It was the perfect day for a parade. Time to wake up, your majesty, announced one of the robbers. We are here to dress you for the parade. Prepare to behold the most beautiful suit anyone has ever seen. What do you think? The other robber asked, pointing toward a chair. He was acting as if a suit were draped over it. But all the emperor saw was the chair. Not wanting to appear foolish, he exclaimed, Why, it's magnificent! The robbers pretended to help the emperor dress. Then they took their gold and fled the village as quickly as they could. The parade began. When the emperor's carriage came into view, the people stared in surprise and shock. The emperor was in his underwear. But no one wanted to appear foolish, so they cried, Look how beautiful the emperor's new clothes are! Then the emperor's carriage passed by a little boy. The child was confused. He didn't see the beautiful clothes everyone was talking about. Why is the emperor in his underwear? 
he asked his father loudly. Suddenly, everyone realized the truth. The emperor really was in his underwear. The emperor isn't wearing any clothes, they all began to tell each other. The emperor couldn't help but hear them. He turned red with embarrassment. Now he understood that the men had cheated him. The emperor was grateful to the little boy for teaching everyone a valuable lesson. The Fox and the Stork Aesop's Fables What is a fable? A fable is a short story or tale that is intended to teach a lesson. All of the fables in this library were told long ago by a man named Aesop. The Fox and the Stork A fox invited his friend the stork to dinner. Wanting to play a trick on his friend, the fox served the stork a dinner of soup in a shallow dish. The fox could easily lap up the soup with his tongue, but because of her very long beak, the stork could hardly drink a drop. The stork left the dinner hungry and a little bit angry about being tricked. The next day, the fox pretended to be concerned about the stork. He asked if she had liked his soup, since she had eaten almost none of it. The stork said nothing bad about the soup, but instead decided to teach the fox a lesson. She invited the fox to join her for dinner at her house that night. The fox arrived that evening and sat down, licking his lips hungrily while he waited for the stork to serve dinner. The soup was served in tall, narrow jars. The stork could easily drink her soup with her long beak. But the fox could not eat from his tall jar. He could only lap up the soup as it ran down its side. The fox, of course, went home hungry that night, just like the stork had the night before. The fox knew that he could not be angry with the stork, because she had simply done to him what he had done to her. The fox learned an important lesson. You should always treat people the way you would like them to treat you. The End The Tortoise and the Hare Aesop's Fables What are Aesop's Fables? Legend tells us that Aesop lived a very long time ago in a place called Greece and became famous for telling stories that were intended to teach lessons about life. We call his stories Aesop's Fables. The Tortoise and the Hare One day a hare, a kind of rabbit, was bragging about how fast he could run and laughing at a tortoise, a kind of turtle, for being so slow. Much to the hare's surprise, the tortoise challenged the hare to a race. Thinking that this was very funny, the hare accepted the challenge. The tortoise and the hare asked their friend the fox to judge the race. The race began, and of course, the hare was soon far ahead of the tortoise. Soon, the hare had reached the halfway point in the race. Because it was a beautiful sunny day, the hare decided to stop running and play a while. He then took a nap in a shady spot. Even if the tortoise passes me while I sleep, thought the hare, I can easily catch up and reach the finish line first. The tortoise, meanwhile, kept walking along slowly and steadily toward the finish line. He couldn't run nearly as fast as the hare, but he never stopped to rest or play. While the tortoise continued on, the hare lost track of time and slept longer than he had intended. When the hare woke up, he was surprised that the tortoise was nowhere in sight. The hare jumped up and ran off at full speed. But when the hare reached the finish line, he found that the tortoise was already there waiting for him. 
Although the tortoise was much slower than the hare, because the tortoise did not stop to rest, he won the race. The end. Moral of the story: slow and steady wins the race. Goldilocks and the Three Bears. Once upon a time, there were three bears. There was the great big Papa Bear, the medium-sized Mama Bear, and the cute little baby bear. They all lived together in a cottage in the woods. One sunny Saturday morning, Papa Bear was making hot cereal with cinnamon and honey for breakfast. As Mama Bear placed the steaming bowls of cereal on the table, she noticed the cereal was too hot to eat. Why don't we take a walk before breakfast? She suggested. Good idea," said Papa Bear. "We'll take a walk, and by the time we return, the cereal will be cool enough to eat." Let's go!" shouted Baby Bear impatiently. He loved going for walks. The three bears ambled out the door, leaving it open behind them. Meanwhile, a little girl named Goldilocks was at home with her mother in a cottage near the woods. Goldilocks and her mother were going to take a walk too. They hoped to find some berries for Goldilocks's mother to bake into a lovely pie. Goldilocks quickly got dressed, brushed her teeth and hair, and headed for the door. Time to go! She announced. I'm still getting ready, dear. Called her mother from the bedroom. Goldilocks couldn't wait to go outside and enjoy the beautiful day. I know, she thought. I'll go pick some flowers to surprise Mummy. I'll be right back, she called to her mother as she left the cottage. Goldilocks didn't wait for a reply. She skipped out the front door and right to the edge of the woods. But then, she hesitated. She remembered her mother telling her never to go into the woods alone. But then Goldilocks thought about how surprised and happy her mother would be with the flowers. She thought, "I'll go a little way into the woods, pick some flowers, and come right back out." As Goldilocks walked in the forest looking for flowers, she noticed the Bear family's cottage, which had beautiful wildflowers growing all around it. Goldilocks walked into the yard and stopped. She could smell a wonderful aroma coming from inside, and she was hungry. Goldilocks slowly walked up to the open front door. "Hello," she called out, peeking inside. When no one answered, Goldilocks stepped into the house and looked around. She saw the three bowls of cereal on the table. Oh, that looks delicious," she said. "Is anyone home?" Goldilocks called out again. Again, no one answered. Goldilocks was about to help herself to the cereal. Then she remembered her mother telling her not to take something that belonged to someone else without asking. But Goldilocks was so very hungry. That she couldn't resist. I'll just take a little taste," she said to herself. First, Goldilocks took a taste from Papa Bear's great big bowl. "Ow, this cereal is too hot," Goldilocks said. Then she took a spoonful from the medium-sized bowl. "Yuck," said Goldilocks. This cereal is too cold. Finally, she took a taste from the smallest bowl. Mmm, this cereal is just right," said Goldilocks. Before she knew it, she had gobbled up every last bite of Baby Bear cereal. I'm so full," Goldilocks said to herself. "I'll just sit for a moment and rest before going home." Goldilocks went into the living room where she saw three chairs. First, 
She tried Papa Bear's very large chair, but she found it uncomfortable. This chair is too hard, Goldilocks said. Then she sat in Mama Bear's medium-sized chair, but she decided it was too soft. When she saw Baby Bear's little rocking chair, Goldilocks said, Now this chair looks just right. But as soon as she sat down, Crack! The chair broke. By now, Goldilocks was very tired. I'll just lie down for a moment before I go home, she told herself. Goldilocks wandered upstairs, where she came upon Mama and Papa Bear's room. First, she climbed into Papa Bear's bed, which was very large. Goldilocks tossed and turned. Mm, this bed is too hard, she declared. Next, she tried Mama Bear's medium-sized bed. This bed is too soft, Goldilocks complained as she sank into the middle. Finally, Goldilocks found Baby Bear's room. She climbed into his little bed, sighed, and said, <sighs> This bed is just right. Within seconds, she was fast asleep. Soon, the three bears came home from their walk, hungry for their breakfast. Hmm, said Papa Bear as they sat down at the table. Look at my spoon. I think someone has been eating my cereal. Oh, look, cried Mama Bear. There is a stain on my pretty tablecloth. I think someone has been eating my cereal, too. Then Baby Bear looked at his bowl and began to cry. <laughs> someone has been eating my cereal, too, and it's all gone, he said. Papa Bear stomped into the living room. He noticed that his chair was not exactly where he had left it. Someone has been sitting in my chair, he declared. Mama Bear straightened the pillow on her chair. Someone has been sitting in my chair, too, she said. Baby Bear hurried over to his chair and started to cry. <laughs> Mama! Papa, someone has been sitting in my chair, too. <laughs> and it's broken, he said. I'm going to see if anything else is out of place, said Papa Bear. He marched up the stairs with Mama Bear and Baby Bear right behind him. Papa Bear looked at his bed. Someone has been lying in my bed. Just look at those covers, he bellowed. Mama Bear looked at her bed. Someone has been lying in my bed, too. See, my pillow is on the floor, she said. Across the hall, Baby Bear called out to his parents. Mama, Papa... Someone has been in my bed, too, and she's still in it. Goldilocks woke up and saw the three bears standing over her. She had never seen a bear up close before. The three bears had never seen a little girl up close before, either. For a long moment, they just looked at each other. Then Goldilocks jumped out of bed, rushed down the stairs, and ran out of the house. Goldilocks didn't stop running until she was inside her cottage and safe in her mother's arms. Where have you been? asked her mother. I looked everywhere for you. I was so worried. Oh, Mommy! Goldilocks cried. I promise I'll listen to you from now on. Goldilocks, tell me what happened said her mother, seeing that her little girl was upset. I will, said Goldilocks. But first, I want to eat my own cereal, sit in my own chair, and take a nap in my own bed. And that 
is exactly what Goldilocks did. The Lion and the Mouse Aesop's Fables What are Aesop's Fables? Legend tells us that Aesop lived a very long time ago in a place called Greece and became famous for telling stories that were intended to teach lessons about life. We call his stories Aesop's Fables. The Lion and the Mouse One day, a mighty lion, tired from hunting all morning, lay down to take a nap under a large, shady tree. Some mice that lived at the foot of the tree scrambled over the sleeping lion to return to their home. But just as the last mouse was crawling over him, the lion woke up. The lion lay his big paw on the little mouse, trapping him. The mouse was very afraid. He apologized to the lion for disturbing him and begged him to spare his life and let him go. The lion pitied the little mouse, so he lifted his paw and set the mouse free. Some time later, the lion was walking near the mouse's home. The lion accidentally stepped on a trap set by a hunter, and a net made of thick ropes captured the lion and pulled him up into a tree. The lion struggled to free himself, but could not. His angry roars rumbled through the forest as he became upset and afraid. The mouse heard the lion's cries. Remembering the lion's kindness, the mouse ran to the tree and climbed up to the trap. He used his sharp little mouse teeth to gnaw through the thick ropes and set the lion free. The lion and the mouse were friends forever after. Both of them had learned that it is good to help someone who has helped you. The End Moral of the story, good deeds are rewarded. The Ugly Duckling Once upon a time, a mother duck was waddling by the lake when she found a rather large, strange-looking egg lying just outside of her nest. How ah! said the mother duck to herself. It must have rolled out of my nest. So she gently rolled the egg back into her nest, where she sat on it along with her other eggs, keeping them warm until they were ready to hatch. A few weeks later, the eggs began to crack. Out popped six little yellow baby ducks, called ducklings, from the other eggs. One, two, three, four, five, six. The mother duck was excited about her adorable babies. But out of the strange-looking egg came a rather large, funny-looking gray duckling. In fact, it was the ugliest duckling the mother duck had ever seen. What a funny-looking duckling you are, said the mother duck. And you're rather larger than your brothers and sisters, too. But we are a family, so we will always love you. The ugly duckling loved his mother, brothers, and sisters as well. Although he looked different from them, they were a happy family and they never teased him about his looks or size. Sadly, the other ducks on the lake weren't as nice. They would tease the ugly duckling whenever he swam by, often laughing and calling him names. Finally, the ugly duckling felt he couldn't take any more teasing. He decided to go live by himself in a marshy corner of the lake where he could easily hide among the tall grass. He missed his mother, brothers, and sisters very much, but preferred to live alone rather than constantly be teased by the other ducks. Although the ugly duckling was lonely, he did enjoy watching the other animals play. Eventually, the warm days of summer passed and the chilly days of fall arrived at the lake. 
With the change in the weather, the ugly duckling began to notice some beautiful new birds swimming on the lake. They were much larger than ducks and had long white necks and beautiful thin beaks. Peeking through the marsh grass, the ugly duckling thought, Those birds are so beautiful. I am ashamed to let them see how ugly I am, so I will continue to hide here. Just then, one of the fine-looking birds saw the ugly duckling peeking out and swam gracefully over to him. Hello, said the beautiful white bird. Do you live on this lake? Why do you ask, replied the ugly duckling. I know I'm not as beautiful as you are, but please don't make fun of me like the ducks do because I'm so ugly. Ugly, said the new bird in astonishment. I don't understand. You're a very handsome swan. Why would you think you are ugly? The ugly duckling was very confused by what he heard. How could such a beautiful bird think he was handsome? Was he being teased? What type of bird are you? The ugly duckling asked. I am a swan, just like you, said the swan. Now the ugly duckling was really confused. I am not a handsome swan, said the ugly duckling. I am just a big, ugly duckling, he added sadly. No, you're not, replied the swan kindly. Come out and see for yourself. So the ugly duckling swam out of the marsh grass and toward the graceful swan where he could look into the water and see his reflection. The beautiful white bird was right. The ugly duckling had grown into a very handsome swan. Now he understood why, as a baby, he looked so different from the other ducks. Happily, he left his marshy hiding place. After a wonderful visit with his loving duck family, he left with his new friend to live the remainder of his life among the other beautiful swans. The End The Grasshopper and the Ants Aesop's Fables What is a fable? A fable is a short story or tale that is intended to teach a lesson. All of the fables in this library were told long ago by a man named Aesop. The Grasshopper and the Ants One warm spring day, a grasshopper was playing in a grassy green field when he noticed a line of ants marching along carrying some seeds. Where are you going with that big load? The grasshopper asked one of them. We're taking these seeds to our nest, squeaked the ant. But it's such a beautiful day, said the grasshopper. Come and have fun with me. No, said the ant. I think you should come work with us. It's going to be a long winter with lots of snow. You had better start storing your food now. Why worry about the winter? It's only spring, and there is lots of food everywhere, said the grasshopper as he chewed on a large blade of grass. All through the spring, the grasshopper did nothing except eat and sleep and play. He became quite fat. One day, during the summer, the grasshopper saw the long line of ants again. They were all carrying grains of wheat. Where are you going with all that wheat? The grasshopper asked. We are taking it to our nest to save for winter, said one of the ants. You should gather some wheat too. It's going to be a long winter with lots of snow. I have all the food that I need right now, said the grasshopper. Why worry about winter? It's still summer! All summer, the grasshopper did nothing but eat, sleep, and play. He became even fatter. One day, the grasshopper noticed that leaves were falling from the trees. Autumn had come. Among the leaves, he again saw the long line of ants, all carrying kernels of corn. 
Where are you going with that corn? The grasshopper asked one of the ants. The ant replied, We are taking it to our nest to save for winter. You should gather some corn too. It's going to be a long winter with lots of snow. That's too much work, said the grasshopper. Winter is not here yet, and when it comes, I am sure I will be able to find some food. A few weeks later, winter came, and the snow began to fall. Just as the ants had predicted, the snow was very deep. This was not a problem for the ants, though. They were all snug in their nest with lots of good food to eat. The grasshopper, however, had trouble finding food. He was very hungry and very miserable all winter. By the time winter had ended, the grasshopper had learned a valuable lesson. It is important to prepare for the future. The End Jack and the Beanstalk Once upon a time, there was a little boy named Jack who lived with his poor mother out in the country. One day, Jack's mother told him, Jack, we have nothing to eat and nothing left to sell except our old cow, Milky White. Please, take her into the village and sell her so that we can buy some food. Jack loved Milky White, and it made him very sad to have to sell her. But he understood that his mother had no choice, so he set out for the village. While on the road to the village, Jack met a stranger who asked him where he was going. I'm going into the village to sell our cow, Milky White, Jack replied. My mother and I are very poor, and we need the money for food. Well, I would like to buy your cow, the stranger said. But rather than pay you in gold, I will trade you these five magic beans, which are much more valuable. They will give you a fortune far greater than gold. Jack thought about the stranger's offer. He knew his mother might be upset if he came home without any gold. But if the beans were truly magic, then she would be very happy because they would bring much greater riches. Jack decided to take the magic beans. He gave the rope to the stranger, kissed Milky White goodbye, then put the magic beans in his pocket and headed back home. When he arrived, Jack's mother said, You're home so soon. You must have been a good salesman. How much gold did you get for Milky White? Oh, mother, I got something much better than gold. On the way to the village, I met a man who bought Milky White for these five magic beans, Jack said with excitement. He told me they will bring us a huge fortune. Jack, you are a silly fool, his mother cried. That man cheated you. Why, even as hungry as we are, five beans aren't worth the trouble of cooking, she moaned as she tossed the beans out of her kitchen window in frustration. With that, she sent Jack to bed. When Jack woke up early the next morning, he noticed something odd. Although the sun was already up, his room was unusually dark. He ran to his window, opened his curtain, and saw that the sunlight was blocked by a gigantic beanstalk that had grown up into the sky during the night. Jack immediately decided to climb up the beanstalk in hopes of finding his fortune. Jack climbed and climbed and climbed until he finally reached the top of the beanstalk 
just above a patch of fluffy white clouds. There, he saw a beautiful grassy field with a huge castle off in the distance. He quickly jumped off the beanstalk and walked toward the castle. It was a very long walk. By the time he reached the massive front door, he was very hungry because he hadn't eaten since the day before. After knocking on the door, he heard a woman's booming voice say, Who's there? Terrified, Jack hollered back politely. Just a hungry boy, ma'am. The door opened with a loud creak, and at first, Jack didn't see anyone, that is, until he looked up and saw a giant woman looking down at him. Jack was no taller than her ankle. You're very small for a boy, said the giantess loudly, but kindly. So I doubt you'll eat much. You can come in, although you must leave very soon. My husband is out now, but if he catches you here, he will eat you in one bite. She gently picked up Jack and carried him into the kitchen. There, she gave him a crust of bread that was the size of a log and a piece of cheese that was as big as a boulder. Just as Jack happily finished eating, he heard a loud rumbling sound coming toward the castle. My husband is here, shouted the giantess. Quick, you must run and hide. Jack was barely hidden behind a cup when the giant came into the kitchen. He was even bigger than his wife, with feet the size of horses, legs as tall as the tallest trees, and a head the size of a barn. Fee-fi-fo-fum, I smell the blood of an Englishman. Be he alive or be he dead, I will grind his bones to make my bread, bellowed the giant loudly as he sniffed and snorted while looking around the kitchen. Don't be silly. No one is here, dear. Now, sit down and enjoy your supper, the giant's wife said soothingly as she steered the giant toward the kitchen table. Luckily for Jack, the giant was so hungry and dinner smelled so good that he forgot all about Jack. As soon as the giant had finished eating, he hollered to his wife. Bring me my golden goose! The giant's wife hurried from the kitchen, returning quickly with a white goose that was very small in her hand, but quite ordinary in size to Jack. Goose, lay me an egg, ordered the giant. Immediately, the goose sat down and laid an egg made of solid gold. The giant looked closely at the golden egg and smiled a broad smile. The giant then placed the egg in his shirt pocket, put up his feet, and closed his eyes. Soon, the giant was fast asleep, snoring loudly. Help me! cried the goose to Jack. She did not like living with the giant. Sneaking out from behind the cup, Jack jumped onto the table and grabbed the goose. The giant woke up with a start. Fee, fi, fo, fum, he bellowed. I knew I smelled the blood of an Englishman. The giant dove at Jack, but Jack ducked under the table. Jack ran to the front door, but it was bolted shut. Luckily, Jack was so tiny, he was able to squeeze himself under the door. Soon Jack was running across the field and through the clouds with the goose in his arms. Behind him, the giant threw open the castle door and yelled, 
fee fi fo fum You can hide and you can run! But I'll have you for dinner before the day is done! As the giant was about to grab Jack, Jack grabbed the beanstalk, still clutching the goose. The giant reached for Jack and missed. Jack quickly scurried down the beanstalk to the ground while the giant began to climb down after him. Suddenly, Jack had an idea. He reached for an axe that was leaning against the house and began chopping the beanstalk as fast as he could. The giant, seeing what Jack was doing, frantically began climbing back up the beanstalk. Jack chopped and chopped and finally chopped down the magic beanstalk. As the beanstalk crashed to the ground, the giant was just able to reach out and grab the clouds with his fingertips, pulling himself back up to safety. He peered down at Jack one last time, then disappeared into the clouds, never to be seen or heard from again. When Jack walked into the house, his mother said, Jack, where have you been? And where did you get that fine goose? She looks like she would make a lovely meal. Jack smiled at his mother. I've been out collecting our fortune, he said excitedly. He set down the goose and commanded rather gently, Goose, lay me an egg. The goose immediately sat down on the table and laid a golden egg. Jack's mother stared in amazement. Oh, Jack, she exclaimed, you were right. Those beans were magic. Then she hugged Jack with joy. From that day onward, Jack and his mother were never again poor or hungry, and they lived happily ever after. The End